Um, yeah, so welcome everybody to group one, which is youth and young adults. We're gonna go ahead and get started. As Andrea said, we're going to do presentations um, about 10 minutes for each group, a person. So five for presenting and five for questions. We're gonna go ahead and get started with Connie, whose poster is titled, The Impact of Arrest, Criminal Conviction, Incarceration, and Other Disruptive Life Events on Smoking Trajectories Through Age 36. Hi, I'm Connie, thanks for having me. Can you see the screen okay? Is that? Mine's still blank right now, but is anybody else having, can, can everyone else see it? I can see it. You can see it? Okay. Yep. Great. Oh, and let me just try to minimize this. Okay. Okay, so I'll try, <laughs> I'll try to be fast, but not too fast. Um, so these are the results of a study I um, got funded for last summer. It's sort of a three part. Uh, these are the, I'm looking at the effect, the impact of early emerging adulthood justice system involvement operationalized as arrest, criminal conviction or incarceration uh, and other disruptive life events on smoking trajectories. And also the, um, the next papers will be on uh, other kinds of substance use, alcohol, marijuana, hard drugs, and then on health generally. So I'm gonna present the, uh, the findings for smoking. And this uh, was, study was funded by the Vermont Biomedical Research Network. Thank you, VBRN. So prior life course, developmental and life course research shows that there are three to six different smoking trajectories that have been identified over the course of individuals' lives. And uh, people will differ because people are different, right? In terms of when they start smoking and if they increase or decrease or, or fluctuate or if they successfully quit or try to quit and then start again. And certain key events, such as a healthcare, uh, healthcare, a health scare like uh, cancer or a trauma experience or involvement with the justice system, can cause an individual to transition from one pathway to another. Um, so this is a study of both trajectories and transitions from one trajectory to another. And this study builds on a prior uh, study that was published in, in 2020 in Tobacco Use Insights. And what I did with this uh, sort of continuation study is I expanded how I defined justice system involvement beyond just arrest to look at more severe measures of getting involved with the justice system. And also I was interested in sort of what about getting married and having children, how does that impact people's pathways? So I had three hypotheses. The first is that there would be at least four smoking trajectories, people who never smoked, uh, people who increased, see, never smoked, chronic, the words are in the way, never smoked, chronic smokers, increasing smokers, and decreasing smokers. Also, my second hypothesis, the justice system involvement during emerging adulthood, which I defined as 18 to 21 years old, would be related to increased smoking from 22 up to 36, and that, uh, that it would be related to increased smoking, a transition from a lower or non-smoking uh, class to a higher smoking class, and that the size of the transition would be greater the more severe the type of justice system involvement. So arrest, conviction would have a greater impact on individual smoking than arrest, and incarceration would have a greater impact on individual smoking patterns than conviction and arrest. Also that men and women, my third hypothesis, men and women would be differentially impacted in their smoking, um, in particular by family variables, for women, I hypothesis that parenthood would shift them to less smoking. And for men, based on research uh, in uh, criminal justice and criminology, uh, marriage has this sort of decreasing effect of men's criminal participation. So I hypothesize that it would shift men to less smoking. So we'll see. I analyzed 15 waves of data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, the NLSY97. My dependent variable was any smoking at 22 years old and then 23, 24, 25. I recoded the variables from, they were asked in every survey wave about smoking, but it, in each survey wave, there were um, seven different ages. So I recoded to be their smoking at the age rather than the year. My main independent variables were justice system involvement, uh, in emerging adulthood operationalized as arrest, conviction, and incarceration. I had my two key pro family process variables, as well as other uh, predictors, juvenile smoking, juvenile arrest, past trauma, and then my demographic variables. 
at the analyses, there's a lot of words on this slide. It essentially boils down to, I did three types of analyses, group-based trajectory modeling, multinomial logistic regression, and latent transition analysis. Skip. And this is what my, uh, my graph looked like. The best uh, sort of model for trajectories, it's a little cluttered. Um, because it looked cleaner before I put the weights on. Once I weighted, the, once I converted the data to long format and then weighted it, it came out uh, looking like this. It was cleaner before I weighted it. I just had four, but the right way to do it is with the weights on. So the seven group quadratic model, which had the lowest BIC scores of all the models and as well as all significant parameter estimates. And to sum up what this looks like. Essentially, there were seven classes of smoking. And so the essence of my first hypothesis was supported, even though I said there would be four classes of smoking. Uh, there were two classes of non-smoking and low smoke, lower occasional smokers, two classes of decreasing smokers. Uh, then I had my increasers, my chronic smokers, and my unsuccessfully trying to quit smokers, which are the three problem groups of smokers. And if you can see going back to the slide, it's classes four, five, and six. So if the colors are coming through to you, the orange line that goes down and then up, that's the unsuccessfully trying to quit. And then the, the uh, class five is the gray line and on top in the red is, or the maroon is the chronic smokers. Okay, so this is just to, the tables are way too big to show, but this is just to show, to prove, this is what the multinomial logistic regression look like. And this is what the latent transition analyses look like in the paper. And just to sum up, so as per my first hypothesis, there were more smoking classes than I hypothesized, but the essence, I felt that the essence sort of of my first hypothesis was supported. As per my second hypothesis, all types of justice system involvement, arrest, conviction, and incarceration increase the likelihood of being in a smoking class rather than the, the non-smoking reference class as per both the multinomial logistic regression and the latent transition analysis. And my justice system involvement indicators were significant even with the other predictors in the model. Counter to my second hypothesis, arrest and conviction generally had larger odds ratios than incarceration, which is the most severe form of uh, justice system involvement. Uh, particularly regarding respondents' likelihood to be in one of the problem smoking classes, four, five, or six. Uh, this it's may be because incarceration means an individual is locked up in a facility, a jail, or prison with a non-smoking policy, but that was uh, not what I had expected to find. Across all types of justice system involvement, family variables generally reduce the odds slightly of being in one of the smoking classes, including in uh, class six, which was the chronic smoking, as opposed to being in the, the reference class non-smoking. The most significant predictor, which was not really what I was looking for, was juvenile smoking. Uh, that had the, the, the biggest effect on the likelihood of being smoking in adulthood in all the models. I also, as per my third and final hypothesis, there were differences by gender. Uh, for women, a little bit counter to what I expected, both marital status and having children generally increase the likelihood of being of women either being unsuccessfully trying to quit smokers or increasing smokers, as opposed to being in the non-smoking reference class. And for men, it was the opposite. So I don't know exactly why it could be, you know, the the stress and the burdens of being a uh, a spouse and mother weigh on women more heavily, so they're stressed, so they smoke more, but they're, so it's one of those things with uh, working with uh, quantitative existing data, you're always left with some questions you can't answer. So that is, uh, that is it. Let me I'll unshare. Great, thank you, Connie. So you can take one or two short questions right now and then we're going to move on. So does anyone have any questions for Connie? Okay, we can always revisit it at the end of the session. So <laughs> thank you, great. So the next presenter is Elisha. Um, and let me pull up her title here. And she's going to be presenting her poster, which is Evaluating a Smoking Cessation Text Message Intervention for Socioeconomically Disadvantaged Young Adults. What is helpful and what can be improved?
great. I can see that, but you are on mute. Great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> this should do it. My computer's being a little slow today. Did it go black for everyone? Interesting. <laughs> are you able to like exit screen or slideshow and just zoom in on it? Yeah, I think so. Maybe. Okay, <laughs> apologies for that. There might just be some scrolling that we have to do. Um, what's going up, going on with that? But good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm, I'm presenting on the results of some qualitative analyses that we did at the end of a um, text and web-based intervention for socioeconomically disadvantaged youth and young adult smokers. Um, smoking cessation interventions are often much less accessible to this group, um, and few, if any, that we know of are, are specifically tailored to this group. Um, so this was a trial of a, a mostly text-based intervention for socioeconomically disadvantaged young adults um, that we called the text study in partnership with To Become an X. Um, the total sample was 346 participants nationwide between the ages of 18 and 25. Uh, and this analysis specifically focuses on the intervention participants, uh, of which there were 172. These participants received daily text messages about quitting, um, as well as weekly quizzes, including uh, that include measures on what they found helpful and what they thought could be improved about the intervention. Um, these responses were all independently coded by me. Um, and that involved a, a first go through of the, the whole body of responses um, to look for emergent themes and then coding those into categories that emerged. The, um, yeah, the main categories that really jumped out from this analysis were that uh, in, a, in a broad sense, participants appreciated this, uh, the modality of text-based intervention. And they reported that it kept them motivated in their own quit attempt. And they actually appreciated concrete tips and strategies for how to keep going with their quit attempt. Um, in terms of what could be improved, <laughs> the most encouraging thing for us is that the most frequent category was nothing. Uh, participants were largely very, very happy with the intervention. Um, and the second most frequent category was that they actually would appreciate more frequent messages. Um, a smaller but not completely insignificant category reported that they would appreciate fewer messages. And this was um, a little bit confounded by the fact that some participants said it um, messages reminded them to smoke or <laughs> reminded them that they were quitting and reminded them um, that they were sort of going through this very difficult process. But for the most part, participants responded very well. Um, some ideas for future innovations in this type of intervention would be to increase the personalization of messages. Participants really appreciated messages that seemed to speak to where they were in their quit attempt and to speak for, to their reasons for quitting. And they reported wanting more of that um, and also wanting some greater degree of control over the kinds of messages they got. Um, and they, 
because one of the most helpful types of messages that they were received were the ones that were motivating and encouraging. They reported often wanting more of those kinds of messages. Um, so here on the right, we have some, uh, I think, really neat examples from participants that on a, on a really basic level, a lot of participants reported that getting those frequent, like multiple text messages a day were just a reminder, like, or a distraction from the urge, just something else to do or to look at or to read. Um, and it also connected them, like it reminded them that they were connected to a wider community of people who were trying to quit. Um, and these kind of helpful aspects were mirrored in some ways in terms of what could be improved that we included some interactivity in messages such as um, links to games that they could play. And people were like, yeah, I would like to see more of that. <laughs> Please give me a game instead of like, uh, you know, leaving me here with my urge to smoke. Um, so these are, yeah, these are some of our participants' ideas in terms of like what we can do in the future to help them in a, a remote-based intervention. So sorry, I'm having trouble reading. <laughs> um, yeah, our conclusions su support the idea that this particular population is receptive to an innovative text message and web-based intervention, um, and that it was encouraging and successful for the group. And future interventions can be improved by maximizing those helpful kinds of content. Um, and increasing the frequency of administered support, which for me was surprising. It's, it's very hard to know how much you want to, um, to remind people or, or to bug them, <laughs> but it seems that we've, um, we could do even more, which was encouraging. Great. Thank you, Elisha. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, so if anyone has any questions for them right now, we can go ahead and do that. And again, if not, we can revisit it at the end of the session. <laughs> question. Okay, great. Go Hi, ahead. thanks for that. That was great. Um, can you just clarify, was this, um, was this a text message intervention that you guys developed, or was this using like text to quit? Or do, can you just say a little bit more about, about what the intervention was? Yeah, of course. Um, Andrea could probably speak to this um, better than I could. It was developed a little bit before I, I came on the team at BCBH, um, but it's primarily a text-based intervention that we partnered with, I believe, text to quit um, and supplemented their library with messages of our own. So it, um, it was primarily under our own branding, if that answers your question. So this was in partnership with um, Become an X at Truth Initiative. And so we built off, they participants actually had to register on the Become an X website. And that's how they got fed into the text message library. But we tailored the library um, based on formative research we had done so it was a, a bit of a hybrid. And then you can see in our logo has the X logo in it as Elisha shared um, to sort of build on the, on the branding there. Great. So we can go ahead and move on to our next poster presenter. Thanks again, Elisha. Um, so our next presenter is Joaquin, and uh, the title of this poster is, Does Dose of Vaping Prevention Messaging Impact Vaping-Related Beliefs and Behaviors in Young Adults? Let me share my screen real quick. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Yes, okay, I can see it. Let me slideshow. OK, perfect. Just OK, perfect. 
Oh, hello, everybody. My name is Joaquin. I am a current medical student at the Robert Larner College of Medicine, and my project was Does Dose Vaping Prevention Messaging Impact Vaping Related Beliefs and Behaviors in Young Adults? And I worked under the wing of Dr. Andrea Vianti, as well as with the help of Elisha and Julia's a couple other people. So the main reason why I wanted to choose uh, this cohort, and, and when I mean cohort, I mean young adults aged 18 to 24, and electronic vapor products or EVPs is because these products have become extremely prevalent in the past couple of years. There has been an, a massive uptake in their usage between the youth cohort and young adults. However, there hasn't really been that much focus in examining the effects of these products in young adults aged 18 to 24, and we wanted to see if the dosage of vaping prevention messaging could impact their beliefs, risk perceptions, as well as behaviors. Um, now, part of the reason why these products are so popular now is because of the widespread marketing associated with them, as well as some false beliefs that they are safer, safer alternatives to traditional tobacco products, such as cigarettes, as well as that they can enhance social interactions, among other things. And now preliminary studies suggest that vaping prevention messaging can increase vaping related harm perceptions, which is good. And like I said, our study wanted to evaluate the effects of these messages and the dose of the messaging on vaping related harm perceptions and beliefs. Now, in order to choose our participants, we look towards the PACE Vermont study or the policy and communication evaluation study. And from here, we gathered about 396 Vermont young adults aged 18 to 24 who participated in both a randomized controlled trial of vaping prevention messages and an ongoing online cohort study. And their intervention, or in other words, their exposure was multiple or between zero to three different messages. The first being Vermont's unhyped targeted digital media campaign. The second being vaping prevention messages shown to half of the participants in the randomized trial. And the third being a vaping prevention video shown to all participants at the end of the randomized trial. And in order to quantify their exposure, we decided upon low exposure, meaning zero to one messages, moderate exposure, meaning two messages, and high exposure, meaning three messages. And in order to analyze this data, we looked at the associations between message dose, which was in the fall of 2020, and vaping-related beliefs and harm perceptions six months later in the spring of 2021. Now, in terms of our methods, we wanted first to establish baseline characteristics across all the groups. So this meant asking questions about the participants, uh, sex assigned at birth, gender, um, their, um, sorry, uh, I forgot for a second, their enrollment in a school, etc., as well as different items relating to ever and past 30 day use of EVP or electronic vapor product use, as well as tobacco product use. Now, we didn't really find too many differences across all groups, but we did find that the high exposure group had the highest prevalence of past 30 day EVP use. Now, like I said, we were trying to analyze data based on changes in beliefs, risk perceptions, and changes in behaviors when we wanted to address um, EVP-related beliefs. We asked questions such as uh, the claim that a vape is low in nicotine means that it is less addictive, or for example, that nicotine is a cause of, cause of cancer. And we offered responses to these questions in the form of true, false, or I don't know. And when we wanted to address risk perceptions, we looked towards the population assessment of tobacco and health or the PATH study to assess absolute harm perceptions of vaping as well as relative harm perceptions of vaping compared to other products. And we offered responses in the form of no harm, a little harm, some harm, or a lot of harm. And when we wanted to address um, the changes in vaping related behaviors after exposure and at follow up, we included questions about EVP usage as well as about attempts to quit or cut down on vaping in the past month. In regards to those, we found that the people who were in the high message exposure group, meaning those who were exposed to three messages, had a greater endorsement of one of the following claims. One 5% vape pot can contain as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes, and that a cigarette brand low in nicotine means that it is less addictive at follow-up compared to the low exposure young adults, which means those that were exposed to zero to one messages. However, we also found that the high exposure group had a lower mean perceived risk from weekly EVP use at follow-up, which when we were looking towards that result, we kind of attributed to the fact that some of the people that were in the study were already EVP users. So that could influence within their own bias, their perception of the risk of using EVP products. And in terms of our conclusions, the, it wasn't really 
uh, direct success in terms of our hypothesis because we thought that higher message exposure would mean higher changes in beliefs and risk perceptions. But the results they suggest that greater exposure to vaping prevention messages can result in more accurate nicotine beliefs, but they may not increase vaping related harm perceptions, particularly in those people that were already using EVPs, such as the ones that answered that they, and like I said in the previous slide, that they had a lower mean perceived risk from weekly EVP use at follow up. And our recommendations were, were that incorporating vaping cessation content and pre prevention messaging can promote greater vaping reduction in young adults. And these are the fundings and disclosures as well as my contact. And I don't know how to stop sharing. Okay, there <laughs> great. we go. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was great. Does anyone have any questions? Right now we have a few minutes that we could do some. Right. Well, we can always revisit it as <laughs> with the last ones. So we'll go ahead and move on to our last presenter, and that is Julia. And she's presenting her poster, which is Harnessing Mass Media Substance Use Prevention Campaigns to Inform Poly Tobacco um, Use Prevention in the US, in US adolescents and young adults, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you can say that much better than I can. <laughs> it's okay, it's a long title, it's a mouthful. Um, let me share my screen. Is that right? We'll see. I guess we'll find out. I can, can you see, all see it. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so hi everyone. My name is Julia West. I am a third year clinical psychology PhD student um, at BCBH, and I work with Andrea Valanti as well. Um, we have a nice uh, crew <laughs> today. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a systematic review on um, mass media prevention efforts um, for youth and young adults um, for prevention for alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco use. So um, basically, you know, despite this overall reduction that we've seen in cigarette smoking prevalence, young adults report more than twice the prevalence of current e-cigarette use, cigarilla use, hookah, filtered cigars, and snooze use compared to older adults. And in 2019, nearly a quarter of middle and high school students used tobacco in the past 30 days. That was from the Monitoring the Future survey. And um, of that, 25% um, of students, more than a third of them reported dual or poly tobacco use. So the high prevalence of e-cigarette use in young people likely stems from beliefs that e-cigarettes are less harmful to health, they're less addictive and more socially acceptable than combustible cigarettes. Um, and similar beliefs might drive the high prevalence of poly tobacco and poly substance use in um, young people. So um, previous public education mass media campaigns have successfully targeted beliefs about tobacco as a way to change public attitudes toward tobacco use and ultimately change behavior um, and change smoking rates. So the goal of this study was to learn from the broader literature on substance use, um, alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco to inform poly tobacco, tobacco messaging and try to give us an idea of how we could target um, the use of multiple products in messaging. So we performed a systematic review of campaign evaluations and formative research on those three substances. And um, the, um, we searched five large databases and had two independent reviewers. One of them was Elisha um, and they coded 11,310 titles and abstracts and 488 full texts. Um, so this was a massive review. Uh, we ended up with 69 campaign evaluations that were included 
18 um, qualitative formative articles and then 13 quantitative formative articles. Um, and we still have a few more formative to go through. So um, those numbers are gonna jump a little bit. Um, and in general, I don't know how well you all can see the flow chart because the exclusion criteria are there, but it looks really small on my screen and my screen is giant. Um, so you probably can't. So um, in general, for the campaign evaluations, we did not include individual treatment trials like smoking cessation trials. Um, we did not include prevention interventions that included um, school programming. So there were some that had school programming um, that we did include, but we only did if there was a way that we could isolate the effects of the mass media campaign. So if there was a group that only received school programming and a group that received mass media messaging and school programming, then that would be something that might be included. But if the main um, kind of intervention included school programming and there was no way to um, pull out the effect of the messaging, then um, it was not included. Similarly, we didn't include campaigns that weren't direct to the individual. So if they were, um, mess if it was campaigns that were targeting parents or teachers, educators, um, those were also not included. Hey, Jules. Oh, it looks like she disconnected. <laughs> I think everybody got cut off from hearing her. Hopefully she can get back on. Oh, no. <laughs> The trials and tribulations of web-based conferences. Yes. <laughs> it's been going really well though. It's been a great conference. We appreciate all you guys are doing for this. Mm -hmm. Hopefully she'll get back on. Yeah, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions for our other presenters, go ahead and um, feel free to ask them. Hopefully Julia can rejoin us. I have a question for Connie. Um, so looking at your trajectories, looks like you have the biggest proportion of people in that low non-smoking group and then the second highest in the chronic, kind of yes. they stay high. Um, what were their predictors? How were, how was involvement with criminal justice associated with either of those patterns? Um. Okay, so can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so here's my cluttered graph. Okay, so yeah, the um, two, it, it's not helpful that the software, the numbers that they assign to them aren't in, like this should really be one or zero, but anyway, so two is, so that's nearly half of the sample falls into the no smoking and then another, uh, it's 9%. So it's uh, 55, 60% of people are in the non or low smoking. And then for the chronic smoking, it's like the 22%. And that's just the, um, the smoking behaviors without looking at any of the justice system involvement. Now, I'm sorry, can you, forgive me, can you repeat your question? Was um, justice system involvement correlated with or not no involvement correlated with either of those classes? Uh, oh, I need to see if I can find it in the paper. It was, I don't have it in the slides, right? I do not. 
uh, how to answer this question. Um, there were some people who were justice system involved and were non-smokers, but there were, but there were a, a higher percentage of people who were, who had been either arrested or convicted or incarcerated who had some sort, I'm not gonna be able to explain it clearly, but uh, if, I don't know if you can see my, it's sort of presented in this, in this table in the, it's a weird thing to try to, to, try to explain, but there was, there was a connection between justice system involvement and being in one of the smoking groups as opposed to being an increased the likelihood as opposed to being in the non-smoking group. So there, there's a connection it cr for, I sort I was looking at whether it is, um, it was, there were two theories that could apply to why we would expect to see a change, in, a transition in um, smoking behavior based on justice system involvement. Labeling theory is the one theory that uh, will, it will worsen because a person is labeled, they've got this, um, this sort of dark mark on their, you know, have you ever been arrested or convicted of a crime? Yes, they have to check that off. And then people start to treat them differently. And so they internalize it because now they've got that label of being a felon, kind of like the uh, the scarlet A from the scarlet letter. So that with using, a, as per labeling theory, somebody who gets even just arrested or convicted uh, is going, should shift to worse smoking, worse off, worse from what they uh, were had before. So if they had low smoking, they would shift, if the theory is right, they would shift to more smoking or increasing smoking. Alternatively, there's the idea of a teachable moment with it, which I think is in the public health literature as well, uh, where um, it could, some people, well, they had this experience of going through the justice system and then they have to, oh, I have to get my life together. And so they, they stop smoking. And maybe if they were locked up, they were in a facility where they couldn't smoke. And so they got out and they just figured I'll just keep not smoking and they sort of tried to get their life back on track. I didn't find a whole lot of support for that. What I found was support for, uh, for the labeling theory that um, justice system involvement because it's, it's a stressor, it's not a good environment to be uh, in a probation office or on parole or locked up that it, makes, it just makes smoking worse, particularly for arrest and conviction. Does that kind of answer the question? I feel like that was a long, <laughs> that was a long convoluted yeah. answer. Great, thank you, Connie. So Julia, I think, has made it back. And <laughs> go ahead and let her finish the rest of her presentation. Awesome, thanks. I, you'd think being in your office, the internet would be more stable, but I should have known better because UVM has been having some trouble lately. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again and fingers crossed. Oh, oh gosh, there we go. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, so I don't know how much you all heard, but I was talking about um, the inclusion criteria. Um, and I think I got through the campaign evaluation inclusion criteria. Um, and basically for formative research, it was a little bit more broad, except for we excluded campaign evaluations. Um, we ex excluded individual treatment trials. Um, however, we included um, messaging trials. We included uh, qualitative studies that were um, designed with the intention of informing campaign evaluations or, or uh, sorry, mass media campaigns um, or um, messaging um, trials. So in general, the inclusion criteria were a lot broader for the formative research. Um, and what we found was basically that none of the um, campaign evaluations showed that the alcohol or marijuana mass media campaigns had been effective. Um, and um, one of the campaign evaluations for above the influence 
actually showed that it had, um, in some situations, the opposite impact of what was desired. Um, but the really great and positive news, which is something that you know a lot of us in the prevention world know, is that truth, the real cost, um, and tips for, for, from former smokers have been really effective campaigns and have had awesome results um, using beliefs as a mechanism to change behaviors and um, public attitudes. So that was really exciting. Um, and then within those effective campaigns, we found that um, with the exception of Truth's uh, Finish It campaign, all of the other tobacco campaigns had overlooked young adult beliefs. So the real cost, um, you know, primarily focused on youth. Um, and um, none of these campaigns have focused on the use of multiple tobacco products. So Truth has, and the real cost have both done messaging around different types of products and tips has too, um, but not about the combined use. So the, you know, the effects on health of using more than one product, being able to kind of message. One of the big questions is like, how do we message around um, products with varying levels of harm? Um, and that has not been done in any of these campaigns. And um, none of the campaigns for um, alcohol or marijuana have targeted polyuse um, or had like these kind of nuanced messages um, that we can model from. So in general, kind of the big um, findings are that you know, we really need more information about how we can target um, young people's beliefs about using more than one substance. And um, we also need to make sure in general that our prevention efforts are still capturing young adults um, because they're a really vulnerable um, group and are vulnerable to initiation. So. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Julia. Yeah, sorry to <laughs> get interrupted halfway through. <laughs> no, I'm glad you were able to make it back. So if anyone has any questions for Julia, go ahead. I have one. Um, this is so interesting. So if I heard you right, the, the mass media campaigns for alcohol and marijuana just were not effective, whereas the, um, tobacco has been effective. Do, do you have um, ideas about why, what the difference in the campaigns were? Yeah, so one thing I will say that I just think is like pretty important to know is that there are a lot of alcohol campaigns that were excluded because they had some sort of in-person um, aspect and weren't entirely mass media. So there were a lot of alcohol, um, prevention campaigns that target social norms on college campuses. And um, they do a lot of tabling and hold events. And um, we excluded them because of those aspects and we couldn't separate uh, the messaging from those pieces. Um, so I, I should clarify that it's not that like all prevention efforts for alcohol have um, had no effect. I don't, I, we didn't look into those other ones in detail. Um, so just wanna make sure that I'm not misinforming anyone on that. Um, and then the other pieces, and I can't say definitively, um, and there's still a lot more that I need to look into. Some of the things that um, I think come up in general, one of the tactics that Truth uses that's been really effective um, is kind of this like anti-industry um, messaging rather than focusing just on harms. And what they saw in Finish It was that the anti-industry messaging was 
more salient and more effective, more likable among young adults. Um, and it was similarly effective for youth, but youth also found um, health, like harms related messaging effective, um, or they also liked harms um, messaging and um, harms messaging had like a positive impact with youth. So I think, you know, that is one, I think really important piece um, when looking at like the differences between them and just the scare tactics I think involved um, are probably another piece, but I think the formative research is gonna be really helpful in trying to unpack that because a lot of the campaign evaluations aren't necessarily testing the messages and the themes. They're kind of saying with broad strokes, these are the things that we've seen because they have so much to report on. Um, and it's really in the formative research that you get a better understanding of what themes are most effective, what delivery strategies, um, what, um, you know, what kind of like tones, like the, the tone of the message is effective. Um, and that's the campaign evaluations just don't go into that kind of detail. Um, so I think the formative research is gonna give us a lot of insight, hopefully, that is the hope. <laughs> um, otherwise, and if it doesn't, then that's, you know, a whole, a whole other can of worms to look into, why? Yeah, I heard Andrea present last week at the COOP conference. And so that, you know, Andrea, your presentation and then Julia, your presentation together is really interesting. It just seems like this is so important, especially going into um, uh, marijuana legalization. Um, you know, some of you who know me know I'm a psychiatrist and I'm really concerned about the harms of THC and people who have mental health disorders. And I, I don't know how to, I, I think that developing a science around messaging is gonna be really, really important. And um, it's it's tricky because uh, for legal substances, you know, lots of people use it without harm and their experience of using without harm is is more powerful than anything, anything you're gonna um, show them through mass media. So, you know, it, this, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tricky. It's gonna be interesting. I look forward to hearing about your work as you go forward. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know, yeah, the, the marijuana messaging piece is definitely something that we've had a lot of conversations about on our team. And um, it's really tough with, with this kind of research um, because my intuition tells me something, but that doesn't mean that's what the literature says. And my own intuition tells me that you're spot on that like, um, I mean, I remember I'm part of the generation that was targeted in these ads. And I think part of what happens anecdotally is that um, youth transition into young adulthood. They have peers that have been using these substances. They start to have their own experiences with them and um, the messaging loses its power um, because they have contradictory evidence, you know? And um, so I, I think that's probably a big piece. <laughs> um, and we, so the whole, this was part of a, a two phase um, project and the second phase is an MTurk um, message testing trials. So we took messaging from the effective campaigns and we um, tested the original message. We tested a version of that message that's for poly tobacco use. And then we tested a version of it that's for poly substance. Um, so tobacco and then either marijuana or alcohol. Um, trying to answer like is um, you know, if the poly tobacco message is um, not effective what, when the original one is, is that because you're talking about two substances? Is it, or two products? Is it because, um, 
you know, there's, they're just like, it'll be really exciting to see. There's a lot of different things that I think could happen. Like does the formative mat research match the evaluate or the campaigns and the campaign findings? Um, because when we do formative research, we don't have like these huge marketing teams and um, all of these other pieces. So there's just a, a lot of different um, factors to kind of think about. Great. So we have reached the end of our time. So I wanna thank all of our presenters um, during the session and everyone who's able to come. It's great. Uh, we do have a short break right now, and then the next poster session starts at 5.15. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I hope everyone has a good evening. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.